a quote. Open wide your eyes, son, and follow the Puhui bird. He is not wrong. His destiny is like ours, to walk so that others do not get lost. Kanek. Kanek is Jacinto Kanek, the 18th century Maya warrior. His destiny is like ours, to walk so that others do not get lost. Right there, I'm already feeling how the Zapatistas on January 1st of this year talked about how they're alone, how they are alone, how they were alone 30 years ago. So this communique, beginning with this quote, to walk so that others do not get lost. And not only that, he is not wrong. His destiny is like ours. Open wide your eyes, son, and follow the Puhui bird. He is not wrong. His destiny is like ours, to walk so that others do not get lost. It begins with the word of an indigenous Maya warrior. These are the words, then, of Capitan Marcos. On some past occasion, a few years ago, the Zapatista peoples explain to themselves the struggle, quote, as the women that we are, pointing out not a matter of mere will, disposition, or study, but the material basis that made this change possible. Okay, there's a material basis that made what possible? The way that I'm reading this made possible the women of the Zapatista movement to be able to say that they struggle as the women that they are, not as who others wish that they would be. That's how I'm reading it. I'm curious how you read that. So if that's true, as the women that we are, meaning that difference is respected, is how I'm reading that, what made that possible? Not a matter of mere will, disposition, or study. So it's not just because you want to. So it's not just because you are studying to do it. What is it that made it possible for them to actually struggle as the women that they are? Material basis. The economic independence of Zapatista women. That is the material basis that made this change possible. Okay, so what are, what's meant by economic independence? And they were not referring to having a job and salary or the alms in coins with which governments across the political spectrum buy votes and memberships. So economic independence does not mean that they are wage workers. Economic independence does not mean that they are actually dependent on government handouts. That is not economic independence, as the Zapatistas are using that term. They pointed to collective work as the fertile ground for this change. That is, organized work that was not intended for individual well-being, but for that of the group. Something so important in understanding Zapatista political theory, their metaphysical conception of being is that to be is to be in a collective. So there's an individual who, that is at once a part of a collective. Rather than what we learn from Western political theory and just life being raised in the West, in their schools and watching their media, is that the individual is what matters and the collective is oppressive and freedom is individual desire. It was not just about getting together for crafts, commerce, raising livestock, or planting and harvesting corn, coffee, and vegetables. Also, and perhaps above all, it was about their own spaces. Without men. Imagine what in those times and places they spoke and speak among themselves. Their pain, their anger, their ideas, their proposals, their dreams. I will not go into more detail about it. The compañeras have their own voice, history, and destiny. I only mention it because it remains to be known 
What is the material base on which the new stage the Zapatista communities have decided will be built? The new initiative, as outsiders would classify it. What is the new Zapatista initiative? <laughs> They, for them, this is always their proposal, and for like the outsiders, it's the initiative, which is kind of like non-profit, you know. I am proud to point out that not only was the entire proposal the product from its very conception of the Zapatista Organizational Leadership Collective, all of it of indigenous blood with Maya roots. Okay, this proposal is indigenous. It is Maya. It is Zapatista. Also, that my work was limited to providing information that my bosses quote-unquote crossed with their own and later to look for and argue objections and probable future failures, the aforementioned hypothesis to which I refer to in a previous text, which is the text in here, which is about the other, the rule of the other excluded third. In the end, when they finished their deliberation and they specified the central idea to submit it for consultation with the peoples, I was as surprised as perhaps you will be now that you are going to know about it. And the final paragraph to the intro. In this other fragment of the interview with Subcomandante Insurgente Moises explains to us how they came to this idea of the common, quote unquote, el común. Perhaps some of you can appreciate the deeply rebellious and subversive meaning of this, in which, for the same reason, we risk our existence. The captain. Okay. So here is Subcomandante Insurgente Moises. What is the common? Non property or non ownership, depending on the translation. Well, in summary, this is our proposal. To establish extensions of the recovered land as common, that is, without property. Neither private, nor ejida, nor communal, nor federal, nor state, nor business, nor anything. A non-ownership of land. As they say, land without papers. So in those lands that are going to be defined, if they ask who owns that land or who is the owner, the answer will be nobody. That is, they are of the common. If you ask if it is Zapatista land or of the political party followers or whoever, well, it's none of theirs or all of theirs, it's the same. There is no commissioner or agent to buy off, kill, disappear. What is there is people who work and take care of those lands and they defend them. An important part is that in order for this to be achieved, there has to be an agreement between the residents, regardless of whether they are political followers or Zapatistas. In other words, they have to talk between themselves, not to the bad governments. Seeking permission from bad governments has only brought divisions and even deaths among peasants themselves. Okay, so that's the first three paragraphs of Moises's first section, non-property. And the summary is land, not a commodity. And again, this comes from the Zapatistas' metaphysical relation to being, to life, is that, is that interconnectivity. Very, very indigenous, very non-capitalist, very indeed anti-capitalist. This is why indigenous peoples are always in the way of capitalism, treating land as mother. And this is what's happening in Mexico right now against the Zapatistas. This is really important for us to know, is this project Sembrando Vida, which this communique will talk about. So in these first three paragraphs of Moises's first section, non-property or non-ownership, depending on the translation, it talks about the proposal to extend the recovered lands as commons to not not make land an object to be owned, to have land be stewarded in common. And that is, of course, a very indigenous way of being with the world, with life, with oneself. This line is really interesting. There is no commissioner or agent to buy off, kill, disappear. So really important context in understanding this 
is understanding the Zapatista uprising of 1994 being in response to the destruction of the ejido. The ejido is the institutionalized common lands of the state of Mexico that were institutionalized following the Mexican Revolution of Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. And what common lands are important for is so that you will always, if you know how to work with the land, how to be with the land, respect working with the land, where food comes from, being with the land in a sustainable way, not an extractivist way, a way that is in balance, then you will not go hungry and you will always have a home. You will always have a shelter. And when land is created into a commodity, then land can be what's called alienated, kind of like taken out of its context, like lifted out as if it were an object and then transferred over to others, to another formation, which is largely like another person or a corporation. And the Zapatista uprising of 1994 very famously spoke out against the destruction of the ejido. So the ejido that had been institutionalized by the Mexican government following the Mexican revolution was now being removed from the constitution so that Mexico could enter into the quote unquote modern world of capital. This is World War IV, this is 1994, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement made it so that Mexico had to remove Article 27, which was the institutionalization of the common lands, remove it so that land could be alienated and made private property. One well-known danger of alienating land this way is that land, once it's titled to an individual, that individual can use land as collateral if they seek out a loan from a bank. And a lot of the time when folks go under and aren't able to pay back that debt, then they have lost their land. And now they don't have a place where they can grow food or a place to live. And so it makes it so that everyone becomes dependent on the capitalist market, on the global capitalist market. And so then our lives become so entangled in the death and destructiveness of capitalism. It makes it so difficult for us to fight capitalism now that we don't have the means, the material basis to do it. What is the material basis for our elders, the EZLN? It is land. It is land. It is land as common, land as not sellable, not commodifiable. And this is the proposal. They're seeking to extend this out. Well, in summary, this is our proposal to establish extensions of the recover land as common. That's the first line. That is without property, neither private nor ejido nor communal, nor federal, nor state, nor business, nor anything. So the ejido had the government, the bad government mediating, being the mediator of the common land. And what they're saying, no, 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 no mediators, no mediators, the people themselves talk, which is exactly what we learn from Palestine. Listening to farmers in Palestine, listening to elders about how land was related to before, it is so much like this. It's called the musha in Arabic. And it's something that hasn't been studied traditionally because this question of land has been channeled into private property rights in order to try to salvage land. I wrote a little bit about it. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, there's an essay that I wrote in Capitalism, Nature, Socialism called When the Carrot Tree Was the Border that talks a little bit about this and the role that surveying and map making and cadastro mapping have on uh, creating land as property. So their horizon, the Zapatista horizon, is that land be truly in common without intermediaries. This is that direct democracy, that power circulating in a horizontal way between community. It also makes it so that it, it's trying to also make it, it feels like to, that it can ward away from corruption with that line. There is no commissioner or agent to buy off, kill, disappear. So 
and then there it is. So how do you do it? How, how can it be achieved? And what's necessary is these mutual agreements. And it doesn't matter. Are they political party followers or not? They're, that's like so irrelevant to what they really are really trying to do is try to figure out how to share the world together. So it says, in other words, they have to talk between themselves, not to the bad governments. Seeking permission from bad governments has only brought divisions and even deaths among peasants themselves. So those are the first three paragraphs. Um, please do share your thoughts on any of this. Continuing on. So respecting the lands that are personal family property and those that are for collective work, this non-ownership is created on land recovered in these years of war. And it is proposed that it is worked together in shifts regardless of what party you are or what religion or what color or what size or what gender you are. This is a proposal to share the world together at the level of everyday life with your context, with those in your context, with those all around you. No matter your identity, no matter your gender, no matter how you look, the rules are simple. It has to be an agreement between the residents of a region do not grow drugs, do not sell the land, do not allow the entry of any company or industry. Paramilitaries are excluded. The product of the work of those lands belongs to those who work it in the agreed time. There are no taxes nor payment of tithes. Each facility that is built is left for the next group. They take only the product of their work, but we will talk more about all of this later. This very summarize is what was presented and consulted with all the Zapatista villages or communities, the pueblos. And it turned out that the vast majority agreed, and also that in some Zapatista regions, it had already been done for years. And what we did was, well, propose a path to cross the storm. Propose a path to cross the storm and reach the other side safely. Propose a path to cross the storm and reach the other side safely. And not to take the path alone as Zapatistas, but together as the indigenous peoples that we are. Of course, more will come out about this proposal, about health, about education, about justice, about government, about life. Let's say that we see this as necessary to be able to face the storm. The next section is to think the path and the step. How did we get it into our heads? Well, I'll tell you, we saw several things. So this idea didn't just come out at once, as if they came together and as if we saw it part by part and then everything together. One was the storm. Everything that refers to the unconformity of nature, her way of protesting, or its way of protesting, the way of protesting, its way or her way, su, su forma de protestar, its way of protesting. I wonder, how do we handle that? How do we handle that pronoun? How do we handle that? Its way of protesting in Spanish, Su forma de protestar, in English, its way of protesting. Increasingly louder and increasingly terrible. Because we say destruction, but many times what happens is that nature kind of recovers a place. Or that it attacks invasions of the system. Dams, for example, tourist places, for example, that are built over the death of the coasts. Mega projects that hurt, injure the earth. So there comes a response. Sometimes it responds quickly, sometimes it takes a while. And the human being, well, what the system has done with the human being is as if stunned, does not react. Although they see that misfortune is coming, that there are warnings, that there are alerts, they continue as if nothing had happened. And well, things do happen. They say that such misfortune was surprising. But it turns out that for several years now, people have been warning that the destruction of nature is going to take its toll. Science, not us, analyzes it and proves it. 
we then, as people of the earth, see it. Everything is useless. Misfortune does not suddenly appear in your house, no. First it gets closer. It makes its noise so you know it's coming, knocks on your door, breaks everything. Not only your house, your people, your life, but also your heart. You are no longer calm. Another thing is what they call social decomposition, or as they say, the social fabric breaks because of violence. In other words, a community of people is related to certain rules or norms or agreements, as we say. Sometimes written laws are made, and sometimes there is nothing written, but nonetheless, people know. In many communities, they say act of agreement, that is, it is put into words. This can be done, this cannot be done, this has to be done, and so on. For example, whoever works advances. He who does not, or they who does not, stays poor. They who do not. They who do not, they who do not work stays poor. That is wrong for someone. That it is wrong to force someone to do something that he or she does not want to do. For example, in the case of men against women, that it is wrong to abuse the weak, that it is wrong to kill, steal, rape. But what happens if it's the other way around? if evil is rewarded and goodness is persecuted and punished. For example, an indigenous farmer who sees that the destruction of a forest is wrong then becomes its guardian. He protects the forest, therefore, from those who destroy it to make a profit. Defending is a good thing because that brother or sister is taking care of life. That is humane. It is not religious. But it happens that this guardian is persecuted, imprisoned, and not infrequently murdered. And if you ask what his crime was, why they killed him, and you hear that his crime was defending life, like Brother Samir Flores Soberanes, then it is clear that the system is sick and that it no longer has a remedy, that you have to look elsewhere. What does it take to realize this disease, this rottenness? They said disease. The huatico. What does it take to realize this disease, this rottenness of humanity? You don't need a religion or a science or an ideology. It's enough to simply look, listen, feel. And then we see that the big bosses, the capitalists, don't care what happens tomorrow. They want to earn pay today, as much as possible and as quickly as possible. It doesn't matter if you tell them, hey, but what you do destroys and the destruction spreads, grows, becomes uncontrollable and returns to you. As if you were spitting up into the air or urinating against the wind, it comes back to you. And you may think that it is good that misfortune happens to a scoundrel. But it turns out that before that, it takes away quite a few people who don't even know why. Like babies, for example. What will a child know about religions, ideologies, political parties, or whatever? But the system holds those babies responsible. It makes them pay. It destroys in their name. It kills in their name. It lies in their name. And they inherit death and destruction. So it doesn't seem like it's going to get better. What we know is that it will get worse and that whatever happens, we have to cross the storm and get to the other side, survive. This is the second time they've said that, crossing the storm and getting to the other side, survive. Wow. When did, there it is, safely. I see how they said it.
The vast majority agreed on this proposal about the commons. And it turns out in that in some Zapatista regions, it had already been done for years. And what we did was, well, propose a path to cross the storm and reach the other side safely. Propose a path to cross the storm and reach the other side safely. Another thing is what we saw on the journey for life. What is going on in those parts that are supposed to be more advanced, you know, here they're talking about their trip to Europe in 2021. What's going on in those parts that are supposed to be more advanced, what are more developed, as they say, we saw that all that talk about quote unquote, Western civilization, quote unquote, progress, and things like that is a lie. We saw that there was what is necessary for wars and crimes. How do they say that in Spanish? Vimos que ahí se estaba lo necesario para guerras y crímenes. Now we actually saw two things. One is where the storm is headed if we don't do anything. The other is what other organized rebellions are building in those geographies. In other words, those people look at the same thing that we look at. That is the storm. Thanks to these sibling peoples, thanks to these brother peoples, thanks to these sibling peoples, we were able to broaden our vision, make it wider. That is, not only look further, but also look at more things, more world, that is. So we, as indigenous peoples, ask ourselves, what will we do if it's already over, if it is every man for himself? But we see those brothers or those siblings who act like they don't care what happens to others, that they only look out for themselves and then it reaches them anyway. They believe they are safe, locked inside themselves. But that does not work at all. Pero de balde. In vain, pero de balde. The road of memory is then the third part. So the first part of Moises's words, how many parts are there? Yeah. So the first part, so now we're on the third part. The first part is non-property or non-ownership. And this is just very basically the proposal is land is not property. And we're going to figure this out by talking to each other. The second part is to think the path and the step. And here is where they talk about what is it that led them to this proposal. And one is the storm and the importance of being able to cross to the other side of the storm and survive. The other thing is that there has been social decomposition or the, the social fabric is breaking between communities. So these codes that kind of keep the universe together in terms of you know, don't lie, don't kill, don't steal, don't rape, don't, don't, don't hurt other people, don't force somebody to do something against their will those social codes no longer apply like the way that they did before instead what's happening more and more is that bad behavior is rewarded so good behavior like defending a forest is not rewarded on the contrary it's you're persecuted if you're trying to defend life and that's when it says you know so the social fabric is coming undone those codes, those rules that keep society together are becoming undone. And what is being rewarded is behavior that is deadly, is murderous, and they call it a disease, a disease, a rottenness. So they also hearken in that second section to their trip to Europe and that they saw that there are folks there in struggle also and they also saw for themselves that this western civilization or progress really is a lie i mean the road of memory so we think we remember how it was before 
We talked about it to our elders. We asked them if it was like this before. We asked them to tell us if there has always been darkness, death, destruction. Where did that idea of the world come from? How come everything got fucked up? We think that if we know when and how the light, the good thought, the complete knowledge of what is good and what is bad was lost, then maybe we can find that and with that fight for everything to become complete as it should be, respecting life. Right? So here they're talking about how, like, when did we go wrong? When did all of humanity go wrong right now? When did shit get fucked up? So here they're asking, like, we got to remember, like, what was it? What was it before things got? Has it always been so fucked up? What was it before? What can we learn from our ancestors about, you know, how it got to this point? And then we saw how that came to be. And we saw that it came with private property. And it is not about changing the name and saying that there is a Hilo property or small property or federal property. Because in all cases, it is the bad government that gives the papers. In other words, it is the bad government that says if something exists, and with its trick, whether it ceases to exist. As it did with the reform of Salinas de Cortari, and with the blows against communal property, which only existed if it was registered, and that with the same laws, they diminish it until it disappears. And communal property, let's say registered, also causes divisions and confrontations because those lands legally belong to some but against others. Property papers do not say, this is yours. They say, this is not that person's. Attack him. Woo! Property papers do not say, this is yours. What they say is, this is not that person's. Attack him. And there you have the peasants going round and round to be given a piece of paper that says that what is theirs is theirs because they already work for it. And peasants waging war against peasants, not even over a piece of land, no, it's over a piece of paper that says who owns the land. And whoever has more papers, well, has more paid support, that is, more deception. Because it turns out that if you have a paper, they give you a social program. But they ask you to support, for example, a candidate because that candidate is going to give you the paper and give you money. But it turns out that the same government is deceiving you because it sells that paper to a company. Corporation. And then it turns out that the company comes and tells you that you have to leave because that land is not yours, because the fucking businessman now has the paper, and you leave either willingly or forcefully. And there they have armies, police, and paramilitaries to convince you to leave. It is enough for the company to say that it wants such land, for the government to decree the expropriation of those lands and tells the company to do its business for a while. That's what they do with mega projects. And all for a fucking piece of paper. Although the paper is as old as New Spain, the paper is worthless to the powerful. It's a hoax. It is so that you can trust and be calm until the system discovers that beneath your poverty, there is oil, gold, uranium, silver, or that there is a spring of pure water. And now it turns out that water is already a commodity that is bought and sold. A commodity like were your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents. A commodity like you are and your children and your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will be, and so on for generations. So the paper is like the labels of merchandise in the markets. It is the price of the land, of your work, of your descendants. And you don't realize it, but you're already lined up in line at the cashier and you're going to arrive. And it turns out that not only are you going to have to pay, and it turns out that not only are you going to have to pay, you're also going to leave the store and find that they have taken your merchandise. 
that you don't even have the paper that you and your ancestors fought so hard for, and that maybe you will inherit a paper for your grandchildren, and maybe not even that. Government papers are the price of your life. You have to pay that price with your life. So you are a legal commodity. That's the only difference with slavery. Then the older ones tell you that the problem, the division, the arguments and the fights came when the property papers arrived. It's not that there weren't problems before, it's that they were resolved by making an agreement. And the problem is that you can make many papers that split the earth many times, but the earth does not grow like the papers. A hectare is still a hectare, even if there are many papers. Then what happens now with that thing they call the fourth transformation and its sowing life program, in the ejidos, there are the right holders, who are the ejidatarios, who have the aforementioned paper of agrarian certificate, and the applicant who, although they participate in the community, they have no paper because the land is already distributed. Supposedly, the applicants are requesting a piece of land, but in reality, they are requesting a piece of paper that says they are peasants who work the land. So it is not that government comes and tells them that such land is theirs, no. It tells them that if they prove ownership of two hectares, they will be given financial support. But where do those two hectares come from? Well, from the right holders. The derecheros. In other words, the land that the paper says is one's property has to be broken into pieces for the applicants. It has to be broken up so that there can be several papers of the same paper. There is no agrarian distribution. There is fragmentation of property. And what happens if the right holder doesn't want to or can't? His children want the financial support, but they need the paper. Then they fight with the father. The daughters, not even taken into account. Women do not count in the pieces of paper. And children fight to the death against parents. And the children win, and with that paper, because the land remains the same and continues to be where it was, they receive their money. Damn, this is Sembrando Vida right here. I'm going to pause in a little bit and we'll talk about it. With that payment, they go into debt, buy something. So this right here, it's worth, now that they've mentioned um, these two hectares and sowing life, the fourth transformation is what Lopez Obrador calls or refers to as his administration, which he understands as a major transformation in Mexico, first being the independence of Mexico, then Benito Juarez, liberalization, and then the Mexican Revolution, and then Lopez Obrador. And what the fourth transformation is doing, in fact, is it has a veneer of indigeneity, very much in the cultural sense, in the symbolic sense, in the discursive sense, in the aesthetic sense. And what it's doing at the same time is that it is destroying the common lands all over Mexico to be able to create them as private property more and more and more and more. Common lands have always been an Achilles heel for the colonists who want to make private property out of land and be able to sell it. And when they're focused so much on this question of law, these que this question of maps is also important because the question of law when it comes to land has a framework that land is an object and that it has precise borders. And so what that does is it makes it so that any land claims are forced into that framework. And so a lot of land liberation movements have been stuck in this framework that is imposed by capital, by colonialism, that treats land as an object, as property, to have a title of one person, right? And so then that creates a lot of fights when it comes to inheritance and the splitting and the splitting. That's how, that's how we've had, I believe that's how a lot of loss of land has taken place in the South with black farmers in the United States is inheritance and cutting up and cutting up and cutting up. 
is inheritance with cutting up and cutting up and and folks who may not want to work with the land or be with the land they'd rather get paid and that causes land loss sowing life is a land titling program that's disguised as a reforestation program it's a land titling program in that it gives cash handouts to any campesinos any peasants who want to plant certain trees that the government has for you to plant and you get cash handouts as long as you plant these trees you have to have at least two hectares of land in your name titled to your name as the owner and so this has caused a lot of conflicts as you might imagine on the ground in mexico where folks were so desperate for cash because the situation is so hard really want land to be titled to their name so that they can get these cash handouts these cash cash payments and what that does is it encroaches on common lands some of the lands that the zapatistas themselves had liberated with 1994 with the uprisings and so it's causing a lot of conflict and strife and of course in the communique we hear about families being fragmented and split up over the introduction of private property or of land as private property. So with Sembrando Vida, Sowing Life, it is a program that is destroying the commons by creating more and more land as titled as private property. And of course, it's causing this internal strife in Chiapas on the ground against the Zapatistas too in the lands that they liberated in 1994. Also, it is a program that is not about stewarding trees, already existing trees. It's about planting new trees that the government believes can be of use in the capitalist market. So trees are commodified as well. So because Sembrando Vida is not a forest preservation or stewardship program, it's only a tree planting program, what it's also causing is folks to rip out the trees so that they can have room to plant these other trees. The situation is so desperate that this is what's happening is that we're destroying life by trying to live. So this is the beast that is capital. It forces us into this position where we become the destructive force, part of the destructive force of capital by needing capital in order to live. So if we're gonna fight capital, we need to learn how to live without capital. And so this proposal about the common and non-property is what the Zapatistas are saying, is how they can see getting across the storm to the other side to survive. Without that payment, they go into debt, buy something, or get together and pay the coyote to go. So here's where people get into debt. This is how people get into debt, right? Like the family starts to fight. Women aren't even taken into account because land is titled to men. Very patriarchal system. So then it says, and children fight to the death against parents. Ooh, and the children win and with that paper because the land remains the same and continues to be where it was they receive their money with that payment they go into debt buy something or get together to pay the coyote to go to the united states since they can't afford it they sell the paper to someone else they go to work abroad and it turns out that they are earning to pay back those who lent them Yes, they send remittances to their relatives, but their families use that to pay the debt. After a while, that child returns or is returned. Oof. After a while, that child returns or is returned. That is, if they don't kill him or kidnap him. But he no longer has land because he sold the paper. And now that land belongs to the person who has the paper. So he murdered his father for a paper he no longer has. And then he has to find the payment to buy the paper again. The population grows, but the land does not grow. There are more papers, but it is only the same area of land. What is going to happen? That right now they are killing each other between right holders and applicants 
but later they are going to kill each other between applicants. His children are going to fight among themselves, just as he fought against his parents. For example, you are a right holder with 20 hectares and you have, let's say, four children. It is the first generation. You distribute the land, or rather the paper, and now there is a five hectare paper for each one. Then those four children have four other children each second generation. They distribute their five hectares and they get a little more than one hectare each. Then those four grandchildren have another four children each third generation and they divide the paper and each one gets a quarter of a hectare. And each one gets about a quarter of a hectare. Then those great grandchildren have four children each fourth generation and they divide the paper and they get a tenth of a hectare each. And I no longer continue because just in 40 years, in the second generation, they're going to kill each other. That's what bad governments are doing. They are sowing death. This is why the Zapatistas, whenever they talk about sowing life, Sembrando Vida, Lopez Obrador's program, they always add sowing death. Sowing life, harvesting death. Sembrando, sembrando muerte. So then the next section, the old new road. This is still Moises. What has what they say about material base been like in our history of struggle? Material. So here's on the material base. Well, first was the food. With the recovery of the lands that were in the hands of the large landowners, the diet improved. Hunger was no longer the guest in our homes. Then with the autonomy and support of people who are good people, we say, health followed. Here, the support of the fraternal doctors was and is very important, which is what we call them because they are like our brothers who help us, not only with serious illnesses. Also and above all in preparation, that is in health knowledge, then education, then the work on the land. Then what is the government and administration of the Zapatista people themselves? Then what is government and peaceful coexistence with those who are not Zapatistas? The material basis of this, that is the form of production, is a coexistence of individual family work with collective work. Collective work made it possible for the compañeras to take off and participate in autonomy. Let's say that the first 10 years of autonomy, that is from the uprising to the birth of the Juntas de Buen Gobierno in 2003, were years of learning. The next 10 years, until 2013, were about learning the importance of generational change. From 2013 up to date, it has been about verifying, criticizing, and self-criticizing errors in operation, administration, and ethics. In what follows now, we will have a stage of learning and readjustment. In other words, we will have many errors and problems because there is no manual or book that tells you how to do it. We will have many falls, yes, but we will get up again and continue walking. That is, we are Zapatistas. The material base or production base of the stage will be a combination of individual family work, collective work, and this new thing that we call common work or non-ownership. Individual family work is based on small and personal property. A person and their family work their piece of land, their little store, their mobile, mobile, mobile phone, their livestock, their mobile. Someone let us know what that means. D is that translated right? Their mobile phone, their livestock. The profit or benefit is for that family. Collective work is based on the agreement between colleagues to do work on collective land, assigned before the war and expanded after the war. Work is distributed according to time, capacity, and disposition. The gain or benefit is for the collective. It is usually used for parties, mobilizations, acquisition of health equipment, training of health and education promoters, and for the movements and maintenance of authorities and autonomous commissions. The common work begins now in tenure of land. 
a portion of the recovered lands are declared as common work. That is, it is not parceled out and is not owned by anyone, neither small nor medium nor large property. That land belongs to no one. It has no owner. And in agreement with nearby communities, they quote unquote, lend each other that land to work on. It cannot be sold or bought. It cannot be used for the production, transfer, or consumption of narcotics. The work is done in ships agreed upon with the GALs, the local autonomous government, and the non-Zapatista brothers and sisters, brothers, hermanos, siblings. The benefit or gain is for those who work, but the property is not. It is, not, it is a non-property that is used in common. It doesn't matter if you are Zapatista, partidista, so if you belong to a party, Catholic, Evangelical, Presbyterian, Atheist, Jewish, Muslim, Black, White, Dark, Yellow, Red, Woman, Man, or Troa. Or troa is like gender non-conforming. You can work the land in common with the agreement of the, the GALS, the local autonomous government, and the coordinating bodies by town, region, or zone who are the ones who control compliance with the rules of common use. Everything that serves the common good, nothing that goes against the common good. That's the principle. Everything that serves the common good, nothing that goes against the common good. So in that section, we just got more specifics about what that looks like. The, it's called the Old New Road, and it begins by talking about how they know the truth of their movement, of their work, of their organizing, of their freedom. They talk about that question, what, what has this material base look like in their struggle? And they talk about, well, it begins with food. We're able to eat. We're able to improve our diet, get healthier, not starve. It says hunger was no longer the guest in our homes. And health followed, and they had a lot of support. They have had a lot of support from doctors that have supported them, that they call doctores fraternales, fraternal brotherly doctors. And then health knowledge, education, and the work on, on the land, and administration, and self-government, and how that's based on individual family work tied together with collective work. So the fourth part of the common and non-property, the fourth part of Moises's palabra, his word, it's called a worldwide sharing, the journey for life. And they begin with an invitation. A few hectares of this non-property will be proposed to sister nations in other geographies of the world. We are going to invite them to come and work these lands with their own hands and knowledge. What happens if they don't know how to work the land? Well, the Zapatista compañeros and compañeras will teach them how, and the times of the land and its care. How does he say that? We believe that it is important to know how to work the land, that is, to know how to respect it. I don't think it hurts anyone that just as they study and learn in laboratories and research centers, they also study and learn field work. And it is even better if these sibling peoples, brother peoples, have knowledge and a way of working the land, and they bring us that knowledge and ways, and that is how we also learn. It's like a sharing, but not just words, but in practice. We do not need people to explain exploitation to us. <laughs> they don't want people to go over there and tell them how they don't understand how exploited they are. In other words, they don't need anybody going over there with their sectarian bullshit with their pre-given ideological or sectarian line. Let's just put it like that. We do not need people to explain exploitation to us because we have experienced it for centuries, nor for them to come and tell us that we have to die to achieve freedom. We know that and have practiced it every day for hundreds of years. What is welcome is knowledge and practice for life. Look, 
The delegation that went to Europe learned many things, but the most important thing we learned is that there are many people, groups, collectives, organizations that are looking for a way to fight for life. They have another color, another language, another custom, another culture, another way, but they have the same thing as us, which is the heart of struggle. They are not looking for who is better or to be given a place in bad governments. They are seeking to heal the world. And yes, they are very different from each other, but they are equal, or rather we are equal, because we really want to build something else, and that thing is freedom. That is life. That's how they define freedom, life. And we, the Zapatista community, say that all of these people are our family. It doesn't matter that they are very far away. And in that family, there are older sisters, older brothers, little sisters, and little brothers. And there is no one better, but same family. And as a family, we support each other when we can, and we teach each other what we know. And all, women, men, and otroas are people from below. Why? Because those above preach death, because that gives them profits. Those above want things to change, but for their benefit although it is getting worse and worse. That is why it is those below who are going to fight and are already fighting for life. If the system is one of death, then the fight for life is the fight against the system. What comes next? Well, everyone builds their idea, their thinking, their plan of what is best. And each person perhaps has a different thought and a different way. And that must be respected because it is an organized practice where everyone sees what works and what doesn't. I love that. It is an organized practice where everyone sees what works and what doesn't. That's so real. In other words, there are no recipes or manuals because what works for one may not work for another. The global common is the sharing of stories, of knowledge, of struggles. In other words, as they say, the journey for life continues, that is, for the struggle. From the mountains of the Mexican Southeast, Subcomandante Insurgente Moises, Mexico, December 2023. 500, 40, 30, 20, 10, 3, a year, a few months, a few weeks, a few days, just a while ago. Después. P.S. At the end of the interview, and after he had checked whether the meaning of his explanations was complete and correct, Subcomandante Insurgente Moises, who received command and the role of a Zapatista spokesperson 10 years ago in 2013, lit the umpteenth cigarette. I lit the pipe. We stood looking at the lintel of the champa door. Early morning gave way to dawn, and the first lights of day woke up the sounds in the mountains of southeastern Mexico. We didn't say more, but maybe we both thought. And what's missing is missing. Y falta lo que falta. Is that, is that a good way to translate that? Y falta lo que falta. P.S. Declared under oath. This is, this is uh, Marco. So, P.S. declared under oath. This is Marcos now, and so he's going to hearken to the beginning of the communique. That begins with a quote from Jacinto Canec, the 18th century Maya revolutionary. And then the communique talks about how this proposal to extend the common against private property is a very indigenous Maya-rooted proposal. Okay? So... P.S. declared under oath. At no moment or stage of the deliberation that led to the decision made by the Zapatista peoples did quotes or footnotes or references, even distant ones, come to light from Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Mao, Bakunin, Che, Fidel Castro, Kropotkin, Flores Magon, the Bible, the Quran, Milton Friedman, Millet, progressivism, if it has any bibliographical reference other than its cagatintas, liberation theology, Lombardo, Revueltas, Freud, 
Lacan, Foucault, Deleuze, whatever is fashionable on the left or any source from the left, right, or from the non-existent centers. Not only, I also know that they have not read any of the founding works of the isms that fuel the dreams and defeats of the left. For my part, I give unsolicited advice to those who read these lines. Everyone is free to make a fool of themselves, but I would recommend that before starting with their nonsense, like, quote, the Lacandona Laboratory, quote, the Zapatista Experiment, end quote, and to categorize this in one sense or another, they think about it a little. Because speaking of ridiculous, they have already been making a big deal for almost 30 years by quote unquote explaining Zapatismo. Maybe you don't remember now, but what's left over here, in addition to dignity and mud, is memory. Sorry. Ni modo. Doy fe, I attest. The cat.